On today's episode, we have Olivier Azradian with us to discuss his book and all things quantum technology. So whether you're brand new to the space or you're really in deep into quantum, you're sure to take away a few things from watching this. So let's dive into today's episode. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Quantum Resistant Ledger channel, the place where you come for the crypto and stay for the quantum. On today's episode, we have Olivier Azrati joining us to discuss all things quantum technology. Olivier is a technology consultant and analyst who's helped organizations shape their product and strategy. He's also a speaker, and these past several years, he's had a really big focus all around quantum technologies. Uh, prior to this, he's done everything from publishing for CSS or CES for a number of years, covering artificial intelligence. He was a software development engineer and held various positions at Microsoft France from the 90s through the 2000s. And earlier this fall in 2021, he released his fourth edition of Understanding Quantum Technologies, which is over 800 plus pages in length that covers just a, a variety of uh, parts that we're going to cover in this episode. It's uh, You can find it uh, at oezratty.net. We'll cover it a little bit later in this episode. And uh, It's also on archive, by the way. Yeah. And we're uh, yeah we're just looking forward to having a discussion with you today. So uh, bonjour, bienvenue. Uh, it's, it's awesome to have you here with us. Thank you. Hello, guys. Yeah. Hello. And uh, also with me is uh, my co-host, Michael Strike. Uh, Director of Outreach at the QRL. Uh, Michael, as I always say, good to have you uh, in conversation with me. Uh, Michael, before we um, start going into a few questions, could you briefly privy the audience on kind of the intention behind this episode? Obviously, myself, you know, I'm not a professional physicist, nor do I try to play one on the internet. Uh, could you just give a little bit of uh, context for the for the audience, Strike? Yeah, so this is mostly uh, just a, a relatively casual conversation between uh, the uh, maybe so we'll probably get into some history of uh, um, computers. You might be, you know, uh, it could be some vacuum tubes, some integrated circuitry in there, you know, and the progression, and maybe some correlations between uh, how uh, uh, new newer quantum machines are uh, scaling today versus, uh, you know, how machines used to scale in the past. So it's just going to be a good conversation. And, uh, I'm sure Olivier is going to have a lot of good input here. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Uh, Olivier, before I, um, cover the first question, I want to go into that in a second. Is there anything else, um, that you'd like to add into your bio on a big, you know, big picture, uh, to give the viewers a bit more context on your background? I know it's hard to capture that within an intro, but I just don't want to miss anything before we start moving into some questions? Yeah, it's always difficult to define yourself when you do many things. I mean, uh, I'm a kind of Swiss knife or a jack of all trade of uh, technology. I've been covering a lot of stuff. I've been, I, for example, I was very interested in semiconductor as well. So how do you manufacture a microprocessor? Uh, what's the technology behind that? Uh, I, I learned a lot also on genomics. Uh, I learned a lot on astronomy. I worked uh, a little bit also on the... Uh, consumer electronics, on digital television. So I'm kind of very curious guy. And I fall in love, I fell in love uh, of quantum tech uh, four years ago. Um, I was kind of excited when I saw the first uh, performances uh, from Google, NASA, and, uh, and G-Wave. I was trying to understand what it was about. And uh, I love the, the magic of quantum. I love the complexity as well. I, I love to understand the complexity and then to simplify it and to decipher it. So it explains the thing. The other thing that I should I would mention is I also discovered a lot of very nice people in that place, uh, physicists, uh, researchers. Uh, uh, I discovered also a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, and I found this world uh, very interesting, intellectually speaking. Thank you for, uh, for um, covering that a little bit more. Um, I think moving into the first question, I think a good one to open up for the audience just is to kind of... Uh, intro into our, our full conversation would be um, within your book, you talk a lot about quantum computers in general, them being disruptive. I think regardless of someone, uh, where they lie in the spectrum of their understanding, I think we all know that what is to come is going to disrupt a lot of things. I know obviously in technology, disruption is sometimes an overused word, but um, in which areas do you think um, disruption will happen first? Do you think it's going to be you know, a, a catastrophe on certain fronts? Do you think it's a bit more of a a rolling and then you know starts to happen more and more. 
Uh, we talked about this in past episodes, but um, what, what's your take on this? Well, um, well first, I would, I would like to say I don't use a lot the word disruption. There's a yeah. reason why. I say in my book that I don't feel quantum uh, computing is a Schumpeterian revolution. Yeah. You know, because usually a Schumpeterian revolution is something that replaces an existing stuff. Let's say the car replaces the horse or whatever uh, similar. Yeah. Uh, quantum computing is an addition to the existing tools we have right now. It will bring some more power for some particular computation, like in chemical simulation, but it won't replace your laptop, your smartphone, most of the servers you have online uh, to run your Netflix videos or whatever uh, cool stuff you do with your, all your devices. So it will add more capacity, mostly for researchers, sometimes for business applications. It's adding new capacity, not replacing existing capacity. So it's not a disruption per se. It's a disruption because it expands the capacity, but not replace existing ones. That, that, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's a, a good point because I think that a lot of, uh, you know, we, we've heard this a lot just in you know, regular and tech and startups of people saying, oh, well, you know, all these jobs will be replaced. But if you look back at history, um, it repeats itself, but it, it doesn't and repeat it's not like It's not like AI. For example, sometimes AI is positioned as something that's going to replace a lot of jobs. There were a lot of studies uh, a while ago, I mean, uh, starting back in 2013, saying you know, half of the jobs in the U.S. would be replaced by some robots or AI. And it happens that eight years later and nothing has changed. <laughs> so, and uh, quantum computing is probably going to be similar. It's going to create jobs, new jobs, uh, new capacities, helping people solve new problems, but probably not replacing a lot of the existing jobs. Yeah, th thanks for covering that one. Uh, uh, Michael, do you have, uh, you have one yeah. on uh, universal QC? Yeah. Yeah, so um, for some of our audience, the quantum computers might be a relatively new concept, and some are probably going to be pretty experienced with the topic. Uh, there's different, you know, there's different types available. Uh, so D-Wave's been making annealing what for almost 20 years, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. 1990. I mean, they've been making. Uh, I think uh, the first commercial system was sold in 2012. So it's nearly 10 years now. It, yeah, a long mm -hmm. time. Um, and there's, so there's uh, annealing machines. There's uh, gate-based machines. Um, you also have uh, uh, machines that can use, you know, use photons. Um, what, what do you, if there's going to be like, uh, if there's going to be like a universal, you know, trapped ions as well, obviously, which is probably makes up the majority uh, of the capital that's being invested. Um, if, if, if you think that, if you think that there's going to be a, uh, like a universal quantum computer, which is really what, People are striving to get to something that something that has uh, a lot of use cases across common denominators. Where, where do you think that is? There's a lot of hype around, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, trapped ions, but you know, we're talking fractions of a degree above zero Kelvin, right? So, well, we, we got, we, go ahead. We should probably make a difference between the kinds of qubits you are using, like trapped ions or photons, and the the computing paradigm. The, there are three main computing paradigms available. The one is uh, the main one that people are working on right now, like IBM and Google and, and Honeywell and IonQ, uh, are so-called gate-based systems. Yeah, so it's systems which are using qubits and using uh, gates, which are individual operations on individual qubits or a couple qubits. And then with a series of qubit gates, you, you program some software to solve the problem. Um, a, a sub-part of those computers are called universal computers, universal quantum computers, because they are able to execute, I would say, the more generic kinds of software. Uh, they, they have some specifics uh, needed in the kinds of gates they can, they can execute, and also on fault tolerance, meaning uh, uh, that the error rate uh, viewed, viewed from the developer is uh, minimal. And um, this is supposed to be universal because it's going to enable all kinds of uh, quantum algorithms. The second uh, paradigm is the block of so-called analog quantum computing, where you have both quantum annealing uh, run by D-Wave, also by a Spanish company called Kilimanjaro, and, uh, and the other category is called quantum simulation. Uh, both are, I would say, similar in shape and form, and there are some subtleties which can split both, but uh, those things are not programmed with a series of gates. These are more or less similar to what we do with uh, AI and uh, neural networks. These are a set of qubits that we connect with a uh, weight, let's say connection between the, the, the qubits. And we program the system with setting the weight. And we try to find the, a kind of energy uh, that is the minimum energy of the system. And the, let's say the variables are the connections. And uh, the unknowns that you want to find are the, the qubits connecting the, those variables. Uh, so it's a different way to program a system. And if you look at all the uh, 
algorithms that are supposed to be run on the gate-based quantum systems. I would say that nearly two-thirds of them could theoretically be run on quantum enablers and quantum simulators. So uh, there are a lot of similarities in what you can do. The, 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 the big difference is the performance, uh, the availability, and the time frame uh, of the availability. Uh, what we know is quantum enablers from D-Wave have been available for now, I would say, eight years. Uh, the last system from D-Wave has uh, 5,000 qubits, which enables running uh, uh, a great number of applications, not yet applications which are exceeding the power of the largest supercomputers, uh, as far as I know. Uh, then you have quantum simulators. Uh, most of them are going to be sold in the next, uh, let's say, one, two, three years, coming from companies like QRI in the US, uh, Atom Computing, um, Colcanta, and in France, Pascal. Those are companies who will be able to sell machines uh, running in the next couple of years and providing probably some, uh, some very interesting use case. And then you have gate-based systems. Today, they don't scale. And in the future, maybe in 10 or 15 years, they're going to they're gonna scale uh, uh, much better. If they can only fix that uh, pesky systemic noise problem, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, and you mentioned uh, trapped ions and photons. So you can use, most of the time, you use uh, trapped ions and photons or superconducting qubits uh, and others like MB centers or cold atoms. Uh, you can use some of these technologies for both a quantum simulator or a gate-based system. So you have to make a difference between the, the kinds of qubits you are using, the, the kind of material. Is it a, uh, an atom, an electron, or, uh, or a set of electrons like in superconducting qubits, or is it a photon? And the, 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 programming, the programming paradigm, which is... Uh, sometimes applicable with the same kinds of qubits. Uh, for example, if you compare IBM, Google, and D-Wave, all three are using so-called superconducting qubits with some variations, but, but they use a different programming paradigm. And by the way, D-Wave just announced, uh, I think it was a, a month and a half ago, they announced that on top of their quantum annealer, they want to use part of their existing technology to run a gate-based system. So they want to reuse uh, their knowledge in a quantum, uh, quantum annealer to build a, a gate-based system. But we will start from scratch to recreate a processor from scratch to do that. So one of the things that you said that was interesting a little while ago that I think like a lot of people that are maybe newer to quantum computers is we're used to uh, deterministic output, right? Um, input in, you're on the same input in, you should get the same output out, right? Yeah. Um, with the quantum machines, um, output is uh, 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 statistic, you know, uh, uh, statistical in nature. Yes. Right? There's variability, right? It's, yep. we, you said the word analog, which is not something that usually hear correlated with computer because it's no, it's no longer deterministic. So um, analog, this, analog can be deterministic, but you're right that uh, most uh, quantum uh, uh, programming paradigms are probabilistic in nature. And this is the reason why, in most of the time, you need to run your program several times and you do an average of the results. And so yeah. each of the uh, execution is probabilistic, but if you do a large number of execution, most of the time you converge uh, towards uh, deterministic results, most of the time, for most of the algorithms. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for uh, answering that. I think, um, I know we, were, we touched on uh, qubits just briefly, but with there being you know, a lot of different ways to, to measure it, so if it's physical qubits, logical qubits, um, with IBM's you know, quantum volume, do you think there uh, will, will arrive at a consensus collectively on uh, you know, how, to, how to measure it? What's, what's your opinion on, uh, on this? Well, if you listen to the vendors, they don't agree necessarily because they want to favor the metric that's favoring their system. So yeah. <laughs> for some time, uh, unless you have some pressure from independent, uh, let's say, software vendors, for example, those doing operating systems or uh, programming tools, or you have some pressure from the, the user standpoint, uh, for some time, you will have a lot of disagreement because yeah. uh, you don't value the same way a quantum, a quantum simulator or a gate-based system, even with a gate-based system, if you are uh, developing a trapped ion system from IonQ or from Honeywell, now it's called Continuum, uh, you may favor uh, qubit fidelities, which are very good. Uh, but if you are uh, developing superconducting qubit, you may favor some kinds of scalability, which is not the same with a trapped ion. So uh, there are different perspectives. What, what I love uh, as an approach there it would be an approach that's more uh, uh, based on the usage. 
than on the, the qubit uh, performance. Yeah. Uh, it, it happens that uh, a company based in my country, in France, uh, named Atos, has developed uh, such a benchmark. It's not the only one. It's called Q-score. And the Q-score benchmark is based on sizing the, 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 the size of the, the, the maximum kind of problem you can solve, a kind of a combinatorial problem you can solve with a computer. Yeah. So let's say size is N. So we have maybe uh, 20 for such a computer, 24 for another computer, and 27 for another one. And it's easy to compare those machines. And you don't care about the qubit. Yeah, and I think that one, one good point you bring up on, on that too is I, I think that some people... Obviously, we'll, we'll touch on this. I think we have a later question that covers this kind of nicely is it, it, there's a lot of, within the headlines, it make, quantum computing headlines make for very clickbaity things of making, ah, this is the biggest breakthrough. Everything's going to happen. But in reality, the thing that matters is how is this going to be applicable into the real world and how is it going to actually make an, an effect and a change on, on things? So I think that measuring it that way, as opposed to just like, I come from an economics background and like, You know, there's easy ways to skew data. I think it's like kind of looking at it from a quantum computing perspective. They're like, okay, well, we can kind of like shift this a little bit. So it looks like we're a bit more forward uh, than the rest of the competitors. But no, I appreciate you uh, answering that one. And uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. To, to come back on the initial question, uh, the other thing we have to understand is today we know we have about, I don't know, 400 algo existing algorithms. Yeah. Some people say it's not a lot. I would say it's quite a lot, given you don't have many machines available, so it's not that bad. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, back in the 40s, when we had the first mainframes available, we had so many algorithms running on the, the, the first mainframes from uh, Univac, for example, in 51. Uh, so we're not that bad. But what we know for sure is there's going to be a lot of innovation and invention coming from future developers, even developers who are not born yet. And uh, in 25 years, uh, people who are just born this year, we invent uh, some new uh, use cases. You know, I, I feel that we are in the quantum computing field a bit like, let's say, we are uh, um, working with um, um, the guys who created the first computer, the ENIAC, uh, back in 46, mm -hmm. uh, for the US Army. And we ask him, uh, Could you invent Twitter and TikTok and Netflix? <laughs> you can't. You can't even fathom if you if you had a conversation with someone that time. If you if you went back to that time period, how would you even explain how stuff is these days? It's just it, it's a it, it's a it's yeah, too much change. Too too too, yeah. too much change. So so we have to believe. At a, it's a kind of belief. We have to believe in the capacity of humankind to invent interesting use cases. The, the the problem is more an ethical problem. Is are the use cases being are going to be positive in uh, helping to solve the world's problems in healthcare, in environment, in climate change, and stuff like that, instead of just improving financial results from companies or uh, banks and whatever. So there's going to be some kind of ethical bias in what solution people do, and uh, are there going to be some incentives to go which way or the other? Um, yeah. But invention is going to be broad. It's a standard uh, consultant answer, right? You're going to ask a question, and the answer is invariably, more often than not, is going to be, uh, it depends, right? So... It depends, I mean, that... it's, I mean, nobody can predict innovation. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's whatever the technology, it's like for metaverse or whatever, it, nobody can predict what's going to happen. Uh, and the, the reason why it's uh, difficult to predict, and I've been investigating a lot those kind of predictions in the past, the main reason is innovation is a societal uh, thing. It's a sociology thing. And so it's driven by economics, by sociology, by a deep uh, rooted uh, needs from society and people and the young generation. So this is very hard to predict. I, I, I have one prediction. Unlike, uh, uh, unlike the ENIAC, I think the feature of quantum computers, the lights won't dim when you power it on. <laughs> If I remember correctly, uh, uh, when the machine, it was, the size of a, it was the size of a small building, right? The, uh, the ENIAC. And when it, I remember reading that the lights would dim in the, in the building. Yeah, but you know, about, well, you know, if you take today the largest supercomputers, they are bigger than the ENIAC. So <laughs> you still have... Well, if you machines. talk about distributed too, then, yeah. it, you know, if okay, distributed, distributed machines, distributed, then they're even take, bigger. Yeah. But let's say if you take a Google data center, it's even bigger than the ENIAC. It's a 100 ENIACs. So um, if you look at the concentrator, the IT power that we have right now, it's bigger than mainframes. True. Good point as well. Yep. But you have well, laptops and smartphones who are just the terminals to use yeah. it. And then on the smartphone side, it's like it, things got so small that then they started getting bigger because you're like, okay, like what's 
you, mm. the utility of being able to use it to be able to type, you know, use it as kind of. Like it's a, getting bigger because of the screen, because of our eyes, not yeah. because of the power. Exactly. Exactly. I was just making kind of a, a joke mm -hmm. on that part. Yeah. Um, Michael, do you want to, I think you had a question on interpretation, which I think would be. Yeah. Good so this is a question I like to add when we're talking quantum mechanics, I don't know what it is about my character, but I have to always ask this question. Um, there's a lot, I mean, there's, there's, I would say there's probably a, a strong statistical bias on different interpretations of quantum mechanics and the strongest interpretation, uh, it, it be, probably being the Copenhagen, right? You, you, yep. you make the measurement and you get, you, you know, you, you, you get the, you get a random result. Uh, but there's also, uh, Bohmian and, uh, you know, multiple worlds theory. Uh, I guess my question is which one, which one do you subscribe to the most? Well, I happen to be very biased there as well. I subscribe <laughs> to uh, one of the interpretations that's not very known. It's called CSM. It means Context, System, and Modalities. It's been created by two friends uh, of mine. Uh, uh, one is Alexia Ofev. Uh, she's a researcher in thermodynamics uh, in Grenoble. Uh, the other one is Philippe Grangier. Uh, he's a very interesting scientist. He was one of the uh, father of the entanglement experiment of, um, around the Bell test. Uh, back in 82 with Alain Aspect. And those two persons, uh, they have uh, created this uh, kind of interpretation, which is a kind of mix of the Copenhagen model and some kind of physical realism. I can't, I can't detail it because it's too complicated, but it's one of the most interesting things I've seen uh, recently. But I'm biased because those are friends. <laughs> <laughs> you said that before I was going to be able to follow up with it. You disabled it. I, I, I picked up on that. Um, I think I definitely would like to hear more about that, possibly in a future episode uh, on that interpretation, because uh, the, the different styles definitely interest me. Yeah. Um, but you should you should invite them. Uh, we may do you, that. <laughs> yeah, you should invite them because they are very talkative around there. Uh, there, it's a, it's a it's a matter of ontology and philosophy, and uh, there there are many arguments. I've, I've I've been listening to many events in that space. It's very interesting to listen to quantum physicists trying to do philosophy. So um, yeah. that's that's there, an entire field on its own. Yeah, and it the, makes the, makes yeah. for good conversation too. Yeah. There's also this. I'm I'm curious. Like when you start asking, when you're going through different uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics, and you really start getting into depth, there's a, a certain point at which you cross over this narrative threshold, where depending on the physicist that you're talking to, you'll get almost an emotional response at times stop asking you'll get at the shut up and calculate answer right um so i do you, like as far as schools of thought are you i mean do you find that yourself you're satisfied with you know just i'll just use the schrodinger equation as just that's just the way that it is and you're happy with that or do you find yourself looking deeper and trying to understand the things that of the questions that in a lot of ways People are afraid to ask. Does that make sense? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I'm not afraid. Uh, I'm still uh, looking for some answers. Uh, the, the, the classical answer is, where is the electron? <laughs> 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 A second one is, how do you interpret uh, entanglement? Depends. Entanglement is the more... Uh, I, I can't interpret physically what's the superposition. It's, it's an addition of two waves. Uh, so physically, I don't find it that difficult. Uh, I can explain that with sound. I mean, uh, we, you hear two notes and it makes another note and your brain is able to understand what's a composite note. Uh, so that's what happens in superposition. But entanglement, uh, you have two random phenomena happening in two different places and you do a measurement on one end and it gives the same result on both ends. That's difficult to understand because there's some randomness in the, the state and there's some randomness in the measurement. So uh, that's difficult to explain. Uh, that's it, what it's that whole non-locality uh, part, right? That's I mean, called non the concept yeah, yeah. of non-locality. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, which... But what people have to understand there is uh, most of the time people believe that it's a tool to transmit information faster than light, which is, it is not. It's right. a way to have the same random results at two different locations, but right. it's not a result you can set at zero on one location to get zero at the other one. So it's random. You have but to ask the resource. electron what it is. Yeah. You can't tell so the electron what it's it is. A run, for, it's a simultaneous, yeah. uh, similar result on two hands that's uh, random. But what, what has to be understood is that is a very powerful resource 
that is then used for cryptography with a so-called QKD, quantum key distribution, to, to create random numbers uh, which are the same at two different locations and, and uh, enabling better cryptography. It's also a resource for distributed quantum computing, and it's a uh, resource for connecting quantum sensors with quantum computers. It's very powerful, but uh, it's not a way to transmit information per se from one location to the other. Uh, at and least I, uh, classically speaking. And I love that. And I love that narrative, too, because on one hand, you've got Einstein, right? On the other hand, you've got Niels Bohr, right? You have yes. Einstein arguing sure. that, it, that it's a pair of gloves that at when they're, you know, uh, look, uh, when they were together, that those were hidden variables. And then at what was it? Yep. The, the mid 60s, you had Bell's theorem, which showed that there are no hidden variables. And then non-locality no, does no, no, no. exist. That's not but, what Bell said. Bell... He created a theorem and he, he defined a so-called Bell test, which can help measure in an experiment whether there is a hidden variable or not. And so then there was a, a variation of that called CH, uh, CHST. I don't remember the, the acronym exactly, um, with Clauser. And then you had uh, the experiment of Alain Aspe and Philippe Gangier and uh, Jean Delibar and uh, Gérard Roger, so four guys, uh, back in 82, which used a Bell test experiment to prove that there was no hidden variable. And then the experiments were redone a couple of times until uh, 2015. Um, there were uh, a lot of other researchers in the US, in other places, were trying to close the so-called Hulu poles. Loop poles mm -hmm. were kind of, um, not mistakes, but I mean, I mean uh, holes in the experiments, and they were making sure over time, so it took a couple of decades, to make sure that the experiment was valid, and then the Aspect experiment for DD2 was again validated in 15 without loopholes. So we know that there is no hidden variable from a mathematical standpoint. At which point everyone's head exploded. <laughs> because it really is just it is it's just an amazing concept. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, yeah, I digress. Yeah, where you know where I want to move into now is I want to cover a question that uh, obviously this ties to a lot of stuff in news cycles, especially on like the private side. But what is your take, uh, Olivier, on what do you think? Do you like? Do you think that governments are outpacing commercial quantum computers? Obviously, like just billions of dollars are going into this space. What is, what is your take on the government side versus you know the private side or on the commercial side? Because on the government side, there is obviously an incentive to not be sharing maybe how much progress is being made. So, just I think this makes for a, a good question uh, to discuss. So, mm. what, what's your opinion on this? Well, I would say it depends on the country yeah. and the political system. It depends uh, whether there's a lot of money uh, uh, funding uh, military and uh, intelligence uh, research. Yep. It also depends on the way where the research is being uh, done. Uh, if you take the US, for example, there is no not a lot of government research per se, because even the NSA or CIA or the DARPA is relying on the private sector. I mean, relying on universities, which are more or less independent, relying on large companies. I mean, Lucky Martin, uh, IBM, whoever and then uh, relying on startups. So the, there are a lot of vendors being involved in uh, the publicly funded research. But if you could take China, on the other hand, most, of the, really research, yeah. well, uh, most of the research is funded by government, but done by uh, um, I mean, uh, universities and research labs, which belong to government and are really controlled by government. I mean, uh, even the I army. Completely. And yeah. if you take Europe in between, Europe in between, there's a lot of money coming from government funding public research, but it's mostly very open research. I mean, uh, publicly, uh, um, uh, a lot of publications, uh, all the work is public, even a lot of the work from the US. So so it's, it's, it's a matter of understanding where the money goes. So we don't know officially, for typically, what what is being funded by DARPA and uh, other uh, military and intelligence agencies in the US. But I would guess that it's not, uh, it's not, I think it's not that much. People say, oh, maybe half of the investments come from that world. I, I don't think it's that much. And I, I don't believe that the NSA has some kind of uh, super duper uh, quantum computer in their cave uh, uh, able to decipher uh, um, RSA, RSA 2048 bit uh, keys. I don't believe in that. Uh, so, and you know how, how I look at it? I looked at the history of these uh, agencies uh, because a lot of uh, uh, work has been uh, released on what happened during the 60s and the 70s. And the uh, history tells us what was the, the, the difference between what was available in these agencies and what was available publicly. And the gap in history was not that big. 
Uh, that, uh, there was a gap of maybe one or two years maximum, but not a, a gap of one generation of supercomputer, uh, much bigger uh, at the NSA compared to what's happening in the in the in the public in the I mean in the in the industry sector. So, so in, in, in your analogy, DARPA, right? So DARPA create essentially started to create what is now known as the internet, right? In the in the sixties. Yeah. So. Yeah. Late sixties, uh, early seventies. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and to me, there's not the, to me there's not really a great a great risk in showing pro in showing progress that's being made in order to get um, you know machines to be able to talk to each other. But it, and this is I guess this is an opinion and, and a, a concept I struggle with is I can't think of I can think of reason in which privately own excuse me uh, public companies with shareholders that they report to would feel the need to show progress you know, um, in the amount of, you know, in quantum volume or in collapse or whatever you want to call it now. Uh, but I find it a lot more difficult to build a case for a sovereign nation to be, to want to show or f feel compelled to show progress, you know, to its, to its citizens, which might mm -hmm. feel like shareholders, but completely different. So it's kind of, for, for me, it's like, I, I have a, a slightly different perspective. And it's that I don't know what I don't know. And it's hard, it's difficult to measure no quantum pun intended. Yeah. But what, what I can say is in most places, and, and besides what you believe about the startup scene, I mean, governments take more risk than the, the entrepreneur scene. Uh, let's take, for example, a case of a superconducting, uh, not qubits, but superconducting electronics and uh, computers. It was funded for a while by uh, the military in the US. There were some investments as well uh, from the Japanese government. It didn't succeed a lot, but still a lot of the technology was reused in the military for radars, for example, uh, with a company called Hypress and SIC in the US. Um, some of that technology has been reused for, doing, uh, for creating superconducting qubits as well. It may be reused soon to uh, create so-called uh, control electronics, which enable the scalability of superconducting qubits. So, these investments started in the 60s, and they were funded by governments. So governments, particularly in the US, are able to take more risk than uh, vendors. You know, there's a book, a famous book from uh, Maria Mazzacuto, I always forget the name. She's an economist, uh, an Italian born, uh, working in the US, explaining, uh, it's a book called The Entrepreneurial State. I love that book because it's applicable very well to the quantum space. Interesting. Yeah, sometimes I, I, I get uh, like, obviously, when you're talking about different sectors, too, it makes a big difference, because obviously, in some fronts in the US, like the uh, tech and entrepreneurial space, there's way more risk, like, let's look on, you know, uh, the endeavors of, you know, space, whether it's, you know, Elon Musk, and, you know, yep, yep, Jeff yep. Bezos going to space in that realm, it's actually, you're like, right, right. that's that. And if we're talking on like something in terms of that, then it's the private sector leading the way yeah. there. And then, yeah. but, but we're talking about, uh, a very, it's a bit different. I was, angle, uh, my so. perspective was yeah. over a couple of decades. Uh, yeah. Some investments started a couple of decades ago. But you're right to say that there is a lot of in private investments uh, in startups, you know, IonCube, PsyQuantum, and, yeah. and others. And even the, the, the big shops like when IBM and Google are investing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. So those companies are, in some cases, doing an equivalent. Uh, uh, investment in fundamental research and applied research and some technology development. Some would say that those large companies do only technology development and uh, pure fundamental research would be done by public labs. I'm not sure about this because when I look at the paper being published by those companies, I think that they also do fundamental research. Uh, when you look at the, the work that John Martinez done, has done at Google before leaving Google a year ago, there was a lot of fundamental research on superconducting qubits, not just applied research. So, yeah. um, and this is probably a specific of the U.S. Yeah. because there's more money uh, put in those companies in the U.S. because you have the large vendors there. Yeah, and you bring up a, a good point, too, in my earlier question in when I asked you the question of uh, about, you know, different different areas of the world, how stuff is done in the U.S. or North America. Is it very different than, say, in China um, versus how stuff is happening within the European Union? So, um, that, And I, Europe, you know, Europe, by the way, uh, is investing a lot with government. I mean, when you look at all the government plans in quantum computing, it's more than the yeah. US. It's uh, yeah. about 5 billion uh, euros uh, mm -hmm. over five years. It's more than the official plans uh, coming from the, the US government. But 
we don't have a, a private sector that is as powerful as the, the one in the US because we don't have large IT vendors like uh, yep. the Googles and, and IBMs and Microsoft. So that's the big difference. But the difference is more in the large industry vendor space than in the government funded research space. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of stuff come out, you know, whether it's, you know, the UK, whether it's France, or, you know, something like the Blue Floors, is, where's that base, Finland or... Finland, Blue Floors yeah. is a leader worldwide uh, and it's Blue Floors, it's uh, Finland. Another leader, which is not quantum, but I love to mention them, is ASML. ASML is a monopoly on the so-called uh, etching machines to do extreme ultraviolet. That's the only technology available in the world to produce a five nanometer uh, semiconductor, which are built by Samsung and... Uh, and uh, TSMC in Taiwan. This is, there's only one company in the world based in Holland, and it's actually a European company benefiting from the European Commission uh, research funding. And there's a lot of contributions from most European countries in that space, partly from Germany, for example, with lasers, powerful lasers. So this is an example where Europe can still create worldwide leaders. Yeah, that's. I, I'll have to look that one up. I uh, I spent a, a number of years in uh, Holland and Belgium, so I'll have to. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. seven seven nanometers is second place. It's from yeah. from manufacturing perspective. Yeah, and I can give you another example, which happens to be from France. Uh, we have a small company called Placis Best Tech. Nobody knows it. It's a very small uh, small business, but these guys are worldwide leaders in the machines that are used to produce superconducting qubits. So, so let's ask this. I'm going to tie into something that you just said. We're talking about five nanometer manufacturing process, right? So I'm assuming, I think you were talking about integra typical integrated circuitry. Uh, there's a lot, there is a lot of talk if you dig in, and I know you said that you studied, uh, I, I'm not an expert on this topic. I know you said you studied manufacturing and CPUs and things like that. We're yes. getting, but what, one thing I do know is we're getting to the point where the, the, um, the manufacturing process is getting so small that electrons are starting to jump gates. Right and jump jump circuitry uh, once you start getting smaller than five. Oh, you mean in classical computing, in classical, classical computing. Uh, transistors? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you classical have a so-called phenomenon called leakage. Uh, exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. So you have uh, okay. So I mean uh, Moore's law, right? I mean it's been around for a long time. I think it, there's a strong argument that we might be looking toward. We might be seeing the end of, you know, what I think is started out at 18 months, and I think it eventually migrated down to 12 months at doubling, something like that. Um, have you seen, uh, uh, out of curiosity, have you seen uh, Nevin's Law, uh, which is a, a quantum take on um, Moore's Law in which, class, in which uh, compared to classical computing, um, uh, Hartmut Nevin, uh, one of the lead researchers at, at Google. He's from Google. I saw yep. his law, yeah. He's not yeah, he, new. There's Rose Law as well. Yes. Uh, from Jordi Rose, from, who was a CTO from D-Wave uh, when it was created. He left D-Wave since then, but... There are about seven laws in quantum computing uh, power power growth. There's also a law from Rob Shropko from Yale. <laughs> so Indeed, you <have> many such <laughs> laws. Yeah. yeah. So he's seen. Uh, so Hart Hartman's seen. He's seen at some point. At one point, he was seen doubly exponential growth, doubly exponential rather than just a standard Moore's exponential. Um, what's your take on as far as what do you think? Do you think we'll be able to solve these? Do you think? Let's go with. Let's go with. Uh, let's go with. Trapped ions. Do you think no, we'll be able to solve no, no, this? Let's take his law because I, I don't agree a lot about this double exponential. Okay. Uh, the, the, the Very real optimistic. World, I mean, I'm not that optimistic. So the, the, the real problem is uh, increasing the number of reliable qubits is an exponential problem on its own. So, uh, okay, if you add one qubit, you double the theory, theoretical mathematical power of the computer, but adding one good qubit is an exponential problem on its own. And if you look, for example, at Google, uh, they have 53 qubits, okay, with the Sycamore uh, chipset, uh, which was created three years ago. But if you look at the, the, the real benchmarks they are doing uh, with real applications, they don't exceed 20 qubits. So they have a problem. <laughs> and that's the question. And that's the question, because the error rate scales with, scales with, the, pro with, with the power, right? Yeah, it, or it depends on the technology, but typically... With superconducting qubits, and we have numbers from from IBM, for example, which is publishing a lot of numbers around its various uh, processors. They have 5, 15, 27, 65, and now 1, 27 uh, qubits. And what we know at this point in time is when you grow the number of qubits in that technology, the error rate, uh, the fidelity, so-called fidelity is decreasing, the error rate is increasing slightly. And uh, it's uh, one of the, of the most complicated physical problems to solve. How do you make sure that 
the fidelities are not decreasing when you add qubits. Exactly. And if you take trapped ions, trapped ions had another problem. Trapped ions is uh, the most uh, the, are the best qubits right now with regards to fidelities. We have less than dot uh, one percent. Uh, I mean, uh, one to two qubit uh, error rate. So it's the most reliable qubit. The, the, the only uh, thing is it doesn't scale very well. It's, it's hard to scale beyond, uh, let's say, 40 qubits. And uh, as a result, IonQ and other vendors in that space, but, but even with superconducting qubits, uh, all these people are, are trying to find a way to scale uh, with a technology called scale out. You know, in classical computing, scale in is increasing the power of your CPU, and scale out is adding. Uh, making clusters of servers or data centers where you have multiple processors or multiple core that like we have in multi-core processors. So uh, a lot of these companies are thinking about uh, creating small units of quantum computing, let's say logical qubits uh, with many qubits, and connecting those systems with photons. But it's another difficulty on its own. So it's another challenge. I recall, this a, is, yeah. I recall a paper from, I think it was by a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, uh, factoring RSA twenty forty eight with twenty million noisy qubits. <laughs> well, there is another option that yeah, that, that is a paper, which is Craig, I think is what is what you're getting well, at. <laughs> the paper was written by Craig Guinea. It's an mm -hmm. excellent software. I mean, I would say engineer yep. uh, working at Google, and uh, he's also a guy who I love a lot. I like a lot because he created a tool called Quirk, and Quirk is a an open source, uh, easy to use uh, software development tools to learn quantum programming. It's online. It works on JavaScript. It's online. You can learn uh, using up to 16 qubits. It did that before he worked for, for Google. And then he, he created this paper and many other papers. But there was another paper written by a couple of researchers from France, from CERA. And they did a paper which explained that they could reduce the number of qubits to uh, 13,000 at the price of adding a 40 million qubits with memory. So it, it was kind of moving the target. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting thing. Yeah. So, so, so as you know, at the end of the day, as much as, and as passionate I am about quantum, at the end of the day, this is a blockchain project. So, uh, which which brings us into the area, obviously, of elliptical curve, right? Shores, its derivatives, things like that. Yep. Um, where are you at? Where are you at? Uh, uh, where, where are you at as far as uh, I don't know if you're comfortable with making a couple of predictions, but let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about two fifty six bit ECC. Where do you where do you, where do you see those uh where, where do you what kind of you have a time some time frames in your head is where you start to see risks evolve? We'll start at sixty four, maybe one twenty eight, and then uh, uh, many of us know that uh, Bitcoin runs well, off to uh, fifty six bits. Well, so. usually usually the What's benchmark thought? usually the benchmark is when we have a computer breaking an RSA to twenty forty eight bit, more than elliptic curves, by the way, and um, so you you reminded you reminded us that you need. You would need, uh, with the existing technology, about 20 million qubits. Uh, what we know is, uh, with a uh, technology that's called CAT qubits, uh, which, by the way, again, has been developed by a couple of researchers from France, uh, also with Yale, uh, people in Yale, like Michel Devoré, Rob Shobkoff, and a couple of startups, both in both sides of the Atlantic, working on that. Uh, you would need a much uh, a smaller number of qubits. So you would need about, let's say, 123,000 qubits. But it's still a lot. Uh, so at this point in time, I would say that I have no idea when it's going to come. <laughs> yeah. I would say that it's a very far uh, future, uh, probably more than 15 years, even, even though a couple of people like Jeremy O'Brien from PsyQuantum says it's going to be in less than 10 years. His plan is to have 1 million uh, photon qubits by 2030. 1 million, not 20. So given it's a stretch goal on its own, I don't think we don't, we're going to break shore before, let's say, 15 years or even 20 years, if it's possible, lot, if it's possible. I, uh, I see a lot of, I, like, I see most opinions come within like five to 15 years. The five years are obviously, you know, the eternal. Yeah, you can do statistics. So you have a bell curve. Uh, okay. The bell curve is at about the, the top bell curve, of it, like 15, uh, centered about uh, around 15 years. Yeah. Nobody, the, the reality is nobody knows. What yeah. I try to understand on my own, that's in the book, by the way, I try to understand which are the technology and, and the fundamental physics challenge to overcome, to do that. And um, these are enormous on both sides, I mean, technology and uh, fundamental physics. There are also energetic issues, which have been investigated by a friend I already mentioned, my friend Alexia Ofe from Grenoble. 
she she has a, a couple uh, of PhDs working on that, and she 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 tried to estimate the energy that would be required to break an RSA 2048 bit key. Based and on today's based on the best or? of the best of the best that you could have in the next five years. Okay. And would you guess what would be the energy required to break an RSA? Within five years, I'm going to guess greater than the output of the power of the sun over 10 years. I don't know. Oh, not that big. Okay. Not that big, but... Within five problem. years, that would be my guess. I don't no, see it no, happening within I, five. I mean, uh, with, uh, with qubits with a uh, one millisecond stability, um, which is the, the best of the best of the superconducting qubit in labs today, with the most efficient... Uh, 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 microwave generation electronics, which are required to control the, the qubit, you would need a couple nuclear plants. Okay, well, there you go. Well, I won't be able to be, uh, no one will be able to accuse me in the in the community of being overly optimistic based on my answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing with this, this question <laughs> Within too, five is years. Yeah, I, I like sitting on the side of, okay, well, let's see see what happens. Like, So some people are going to lie more yeah, on yeah, the soon term, some are going to land in the the, the long term one question yeah. I, I well, no, let me yeah. let me finish on that what's interesting yeah. it's it's a huge challenge and it drives innovation it drives innovation in many dimensions fundamental physics thermodynamics uh, it drives innovation in uh, so called enabling technologies like uh, uh, cryoelectronics uh, cryogeny as well so it will bring uh, uh, it will bring benefits globally to the, the field and to society what we don't know yet is which of the, those various qubits will work best uh, to scale. It will help also uh, create uh, distributed quantum computing because we will need that to connect different quantum units. So all in all, we're going to benefit from this challenge, even though maybe it won't be fulfilled, but it's going to be creating a lot of advances. So, so we, we've, talked a lot about, we've talked a lot about the different types of quantum machines available, uh, the history. Uh, we've... I think we've covered the fact that there's a lot of speculation as to where the industry is and when it will get there. Let's have a little bit of fun with the topic yep. now. Um, <laughs> all right. So here's something I t occasionally like to ask people that I'm talking to. Um, okay. So free will is a topic that comes up in a lot on quantum computing and quantum computing because from, uh, well, from a atomic Newtonian framework, it's a, basically an open and shut case, right? Things become deterministic. From a quantum perspective, things get a little more blurry and more uh, probabilistic. So, one question I'd like to ask you, um, did you decide to be a guest on the show or was my invite in your acceptance simply an act of quantum determinism? Uh, you know, what I would say is I don't need quantum physics to recognize free will. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, you, you have a stochastic physics. I mean, uh, thermodynamics is also about randomness. Uh, there are different ways of under understanding randomness in the classical realm and in the quantum realm. Um, you know, uh, thinking that we don't have free will is a kind of reductionism, but uh, it depends on the way you interpret things. I mean, I mean, for example, even though you don't need a quantum physics or classical physics to interpret free will, you can be you can put sociology there. We are built also by our society, by uh, our learnings, our parents. There are a lot of things that determine our behavior, and it's not physical. It's I mean, it's, it's a macro. Now, now, take that explanation that you gave and apply mm. determinism to it, but also uh, apply the multiple worlds interpretation. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Oh, which is the trick? To... Which was the? I had to wait to see which way you went with the answer first. Oh, you mean for the multi world? I mean uh, the Everett. Right, because you can still have determinism, but if you if you if you well, you know, to I would, I would say worlds, then there's all bets are lot, again. There's already a lot of information in the, the existing world, uh, so I I don't. I don't get it. I mean, these uh, parallel worlds for each of the various outcomes of any uh, quantum object's outcome, it would make a, a huge information <laughs> <laughs> problem. And uh, yeah. there's a problem with storage somewhere. So the, yeah. the SSD is not big enough, I would say. Yeah. The uh, universe SSD is not big enough. And you know, by the way, I don't like those people who are, or not the people, but I don't like this parallel that's being made between the size of the so-called Hilbert space. I mean, the, the number of uh, quantum states that you can manage with uh, n qubits, like say n equals 200, and the number of particles in the universe. This comparison doesn't make any sense because you compare states and the number of objects. It's not homothetical. I'm not a big fan of that one either. In yeah, fact, I, yeah. I, yeah, I agree, actually. <laughs> yeah, one, um, one, other, but, one other fun one I want to go into, because I think this kind of ties uh, in, in with your book, and this is just a fun one. Obviously, like with companies, whether it's you know on the U.S. startup scene, Europe, wherever um, it is, obviously positioning is a big thing. 
And in your book, uh, one part you mentioned, I'll just re read from it. Uh, you mentioned many companies also integrate, uh, quote unquote, quantum into their positioning, if not branding in many fancy ways, and either in a totally artificial way or based on using technologies from the first quantum revolution. Um, and so we've actually recently discussed this in our community of um, you know, companies, whether it's in headlines, whether it's actually just in, you know, their, their positioning, whether it's used, you know, wrongly, what's like, you don't have to call out any particular company on, you know, doing this wrong, but what's your, what's your opinion on this in general of, you know, company or companies, well, plural, um, doing this? I would say it depends of the kinds of company. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not against those companies who use yeah. Contorm in their brand. I, I've got a nice story to tell you. Maybe it's determinism. But I found out in my cave that the, my first um, hard disk that I bought back in, I don't know, 92, was a, it was the first one gigabyte hard disk I bought. And I bought it from the US, based in France. It cost me, uh, I would say, in today's price, probably 4,000 euros. Yeah. And the brand of the, of the hard disk is Quantum. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so funny. No, what, what, I, what I don't like or what I criticize is uh, one field that, that I cover a lot in my book, which is Quantum Medicine. Because there are a lot of uh, charlatans, uh, snake oil uh, I would say vendors, yeah. uh, who sell bizarre machines. Uh, mostly it's electrocution machines. But uh, I, should, I should cancel my quantum healing appointment for this week? <laughs> yes, you could. You can. Yeah. Or unless you, you like the placebo effect because all those people are selling a placebo effect. Well, placebo has proven, been proven to have yeah, yeah, an effect. So maybe I should not cancel it. it. And maybe that's it, deterministic. It works, but it doesn't work with COVID. It doesn't work with cancer. It doesn't work with <laughs> diabetes. It works with, uh, I would say... Well, thankfully I'm not trying to cure any of those problems. things. Yeah, it works with little problems. We say uh, nervous problems or maybe uh, psychology problems, but it doesn't work with a lot of very serious illnesses. And so uh, the public needs some education about that. They, they, they need to understand how you decipher a fake medicine based on a fake quantum science. You're talking and about destroying jobs, though. And that, 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 <laughs> that might cause some problems by itself that aren't being anticipated. No, well, you know... Uh, uh, there's always be a market for gullibles. I mean, that's so yeah. <laughs> whatever the technology. So, yeah. Olivia, hey, Olivia. Hey, thanks for answering that one. <laughs> uh, besides Einstein, favorite quantum hero? Bohr, Heisenberg, Feynman, Maxwell. You could even say Marvel's Ant Man if you want. None besides Einstein, your favorite None hero. of these. One of my uh, favorite heroes is John von Neumann. And I can okay. explain why. Okay. John von Neumann is a real hero because he has been a, a huge contributor in both quantum physics and classical computing. He's the one who more or less invented the programmable computer uh, in the late 40s. He built the, the first, I think it was the EDZAC or EDVAC uh, computer uh, in 49 in the US. Uh, and before doing that, uh, back in the uh, late 20s, he developed uh, the, all the quantum measurement uh, postulates and all the quantum measurement postulates we are using right now and density matrices, for example, which is a key mathematical tool to understand uh, noise and decoherence. All that is based on John von Neumann's work. So this one was a real genius. There's also Paul Dirac, uh, which are, who I admire as well. Uh, uh, but all the other names are heroes as well. I mean, Bohr, Eisenberg, uh, Feynman, of course. Those are in, very important, but uh, von Neumann is a real genius. An unsung he, hero. He was he, not unsung. He's people, uh, I mean, people who know about the science history know the, this name, but he's not as known as Schrödinger, of course, and Heisenberg, because you've got the Heisenberg principle, you've got, uh, but the von Neumann model. Well, he doesn't have a he, cat either. Uh, he doesn't have a cat, yeah, of course. But uh, John von Neumann uh, brought his name to the von Neumann model. The von Neumann model is the model of all classical computers we have right now. It's a model where you have a computing unit, a memory unit, a addressing system. All that is the von Neumann model. So we still live with it. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for uh, answering okay. that one. Uh, last one, I kind of want to, as a, as a closing out of uh, our episode, um, which might lead into you know part two, whether we do it live or do another show um, coming up um, based on some community questions. Uh, I'd love for you to, uh, first off, I want to let people know where to find your, um, your book and read about it. Um, which is if you go to oezratty.net, which is hard uh, to remind. Which is yeah. <laughs> so I have that below. I have I have that below here. 
Um, but yeah. while I while I ask that, can you briefly whether because we don't know whether someone's viewing, whether they have a really in depth understanding, or whether you know they just you know have a little bit of sense. Give us a flavor for um, what is uh, you know encapsulated within uh, the book, yep. and uh, give them a little um, you know flavor of what to expect. Um, when so you, it's it's easy it. to find because if you type "understanding quantum tech" uh, with maybe even without my name, you will find the book. It's a free PDF on my blog. On top of that, I've been publishing it on archive. There's some delay, however, uh, because I update it uh, mostly a couple times a week uh, with many updates. I correct mistakes, I correct typos. Sometimes I update uh, amounts raised by uh, whatever company. Uh, yep. Recently, I updated it with uh, some IBM data uh, on their latest uh, qubits. And uh, the goal of that book was to educate uh, mostly engineers, I mean, uh, software developers, IT people, some, I would say, even some uh, quantum physicists, to understand quantum technologies with a 360-degree view. So it covers the history of quantum physics. It covers the key fundamentals of quantum physics without being too mathematical or too complicated. Then yeah. it covers the basics of the qubits, so both ma from a mathematical standpoint and from the physical standpoint. It covers uh, hardware, meaning what's a quantum computer, how is it crafted, uh, what are these, its components. Uh, one of the rare content in the book, which is mostly never covered in uh, quantum uh, computing books, is I explain what are all these enabling technologies which make it possible to create a quantum computer, like how a laser is being used, how uh, all these cryoelectronics are being designed, and why are these technologies very important. I even look at raw materials. Where are they coming from? Who is producing yeah. those raw materials? Are they uh, all coming from China or from Australia or from the yeah. US? So I try to cover all the aspects. And then I cover even societal, geopolitical things, uh, ethical issues. I even cover gender, bal gender balance. I try to uh, show that there are very, yeah. uh, uh, I would say, productive and powerful women which are, who are role models to attract more uh, young teenagers in, in that space. So it's a 360 degree book and the, you know my my perspective is when I write this book I find I find it superficial. Yeah. One part uh, I like but it's that got eight, up, yeah. 800 pages so yeah I like that you brought up the point too um, because I think if someone doesn't lie on the uh, technical understanding of it you go through nicely of uh, some of the history and like you said you you cover a, a number of um, people that are working in the space men women you know all yep. sorts of uh, people that are you know currently doing stuff and obviously people of the past that have set the groundwork. But I think that um, that whether you want to get really in deep to or to it or you just want to get, uh, you know, a base level understanding, I think um, going and, and digging into it, um, it's long. But I think that if you go through, you know, the different chapters and kind of, you know, choose your own adventure, so to speak, you can still take a lot from it. And there's, a, for example, a, a, an interesting part, which is uh, obviously interesting for, I would say, business people or people in uh, corporations, in the different verticals, which are yeah. the use cases of quantum computing. But the reason why I named it quantum technologies and not quantum computing, which was the initial name of my book when I created it uh, three years ago, mm -hmm. is I cover also quantum sensing. I cover quantum telecoms and quantum cryptography. So it's all quantum technologies. And even quantum physics, I cover it uh, in a broad yeah. sense. I look at, uh, for example, relativistic quantum chemistry, which is not very known. Uh, so I try to be... Uh, uh, as extensive as possible, showing the wealth of this science. Uh, the, the science behind quantum physics is amazingly vast. Uh, that's, uh, and I have not finished with it. I mean, as no, I know I've got a lot of things to discover yet. Yep, always, always a work in progress. Um, yep. Well, I think, uh, um, Strike, do you have any uh, uh, closing ones? I'm, I'm great on my end. I think uh, we covered, oh, we quite, covered a bit quite a bit in this first episode. As with many areas of my life and science, I think I'm leaving this interview with more questions than I entered with, which I've decided to make my comfort zone. So, so be it. Yeah, no, uh, well, uh, we, we may have to, have, maybe, yeah. maybe we'll have to talk again. Have you back yeah. on, Olivia. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thankful. It Thank was you. nice to meet you. It's yeah. my first interview with uh, folks from the U.S. on this book. So that's, yeah. it was a yeah. very interesting opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, well, Olivier, uh, first off, like uh, Michael said, uh, uh, merci beaucoup and thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, for those of you that are watching, uh, if you want to um, check out um, Olivier's book, uh, go to the, the link below. If you haven't already done so as well, subscribe to our uh, QRL channel so you can be up to date with the latest. And uh, until next time, Olivier, uh, Michael, appreciate the conversation. 
and we will see you in the next episode. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.